we're back. Uh, the, Jay, Jay Metter, CFP, and Chris Peterson, uh, my, my friend and estate planning attorney. And so uh, what we're talking about today is um, who has the power, we're going to talk about probate, basically. And so the first question here is just who has the power in probate? Oh, I'm sorry, what is probate? Okay. We'll, do, we'll start there. What is probate? There you go. Well, probate is basically the legal process where any assets that the deceased person owns, the decedent, um, any of their assets that don't pass by contract or through joint ownership, uh, probate is the process where those get retitled and transferred to the beneficiary. Okay. And um, so what do we do in probate? So typically what we're doing in probate is the first thing is we validate the will. So we make sure that the will has meets all the formal legal requirements. Um, the second thing is we determine who the heirs and beneficiaries are. Um, the court, as we talked about earlier, appoints the executor. Um, the court, using the, the provisions of the will, will order the payment of taxes and of any debts. Um, including like funeral expenses, last health care expenses of the decedent. Um, we'll identify and inventory the assets of the decedent and in some cases we'll need to appraise those assets. And then ultimately we'll transfer the, the assets that are left after the payment of debts and taxes to the heirs and to the beneficiaries. So the, the key thing to remember is that if you have something that doesn't automatically transfer to an heir or beneficiary, the only way to transfer those assets by retitling them is through the probate process. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, who? okay, now we're back to who has the power in probate. Yeah, and this is the this is somewhat confusing because most people think, well, the executor really has the power in probate, but that's not really true. Uh, the truth is that it's really the probate court that has the power because uh, the probate court is the one that decides whether the will is valid. Uh, remember, the will is a nomination of who should serve as the executor, but really it's the probate court that appoints the executor. So they could refuse to point the person you nominated. Um, the, uh, the probate court judge is going to settle any disputes that arise. So if somebody comes in and contests the will or contests the, um, the, the way that the will works, those, those disputes are not going to be settled by the executor. They're going to be settled by the probate court judge. Um, the executor is going to write down that inventory of assets, but that inventory of assets actually has to be approved by the probate court judge. So they still kind of retain the control. And then uh, in addition, any kind of claim, what's called claim priorities. Mm -hmm. So if you have certain types of debt take precedence <coughs> over other types of, of debt. So like if, uh, if somebody had owed $10,000 to the funeral home and it owed $10,000 to the credit card company, well, there's a, there's a priority of those debts. And the funeral home gets paid first, the credit card company would get paid after. So if there's only $10,000 in the estate, the funeral home gets paid, the credit card company doesn't. The, so what sets the priorities of those um, claims against the estate is the probate court. Okay, great. So, are there advantages to probate? There are some advantages to probate. Um, probably the, the biggest advantage is there is somebody overseeing that the decedent's wishes are carried out. So, you know, the probate court process sort of ensures that who is supposed to end up with the stuff ends up with the stuff. And part of that is because uh, it is a public process that everybody who wants to can participate in the process, and so that itself adds a layer of protection for the heirs. Um, another advantage is for those things that have to be retitled, this provides a, a clear title. So mm -hmm. 
if you and I owned a piece of property together, I passed away, but I left the property to you in a will, the way you get it into your name is by retitling it through the probate process. And okay. so the executor ultimately would um, do a deed, sign a deed that would take my interest from the estate and grant it to you. And so it makes a very clean and clear title. Um, the other thing that the probate process does is it protects creditors, um, which could be an advantage depending on what side of the table you're on, but it does provide a means for creditors to come into the courthouse and say, okay, well, so-and-so who passed away owed me X amount of dollars, and I need a place to, to deal with that claim. So that that's typically one of the advantages to probate. Okay. Obvi I, obviously, we've talked about some of the disadvantages, but what, what other disadvantages are there? Well, there's three main disadvantages, and then there's one disadvantage that I, that I commonly um, uh, will tell clients about, too. So the main disadvantage is the cost of probate. So when we look at, when we look at probate, generally whatever flows through the probate, remember we've talked about probate, non-probate assets mm -hmm. a little bit, but whatever throws, flows through the probate, generally 5 to 10% of that estate is going to be eaten up in fees and costs. Wow. So um, typically the executor gets paid in probate. Usually they get paid a percentage of the estate. Typically they'll hire an attorney. The attorney will get paid. There will be court filing fees. If appraisals have to be made, the appraisers get a fee for doing the appraisals. And so what you're going to see on average is 5 to 10 percent of the probate estate is is spent on costs and fees. Now, that's not necessarily a negative thing by itself, but when you think about it, every dollar that you're spending in the probate court is a dollar less that your beneficiaries are receiving. Right. And so that's really where the disadvantage is, is if you can avoid probate, then essentially you're adding 5 to 10% of your estate back to your heirs. Right. So... Um, the second main disadvantage is that probate, there's just inherent time delays that take place with probate. So the average probate is going to take uh, anywhere from 6 to 24 months to complete. That's, that's pretty typical. Uh, I've seen where the national average is about 18, 19 months. So that's a long period of time. Um, when the probate process is ongoing, the heirs are not in control of the assets. So the beneficiaries don't have uh, the stuff in their possession. It's subject to court approval and the executor. Um, and so that tends to be a disadvantage. That, can, that disadvantage could be magnified in certain situations, like if someone owned a small business, sometimes the delays in getting somebody to be in charge of that business wow. can be yeah, severely be detrimental. Horrible. So generally, um, I would say in general terms, the just the time delays uh, are a big disadvantage. Probably the third main one that is identified is also just that probate is a very public process. If you want to, you could walk down to our local county court and you could ask to see every probate that's been filed this month. And they're public records, and so they have to give them to you. They don't have any choice. And if you were to open up one of those files, or all of those files, you would see the inventory of assets that had been made by the executor of the estate. And so you would see literally all, all of the assets, all the real estate, all the business interest, all the bank accounts. You would see everything that belonged to the estate. Um, this can be, uh, number one, this, this kind of encourages people, creditors, and heirs to um, intervene in the process because they do have a ready source to get information and to get in front of a judge. And so it can actually lead to more will contest. It can lead to more creditor claims than might take place 
through beneficiary designations or for, through trusts. Um, in addition, uh, depending on what state you're in, if somebody, uh, if the decedent was on Medicaid at some point in time, most states have been forced to adopt Medicaid estate recovery programs, which is the state trying to recover some of the costs that, that were spent on Medicaid. Well, those costs can only be um, recovered through the probate process. Wow. So the Medicaid estate recovery program, essentially the state through its Medicaid program will become a, um, a creditor of your estate. And so like if you had a house that might not be subject to Medicaid when you're applying for Medicaid, it could still be forced to be sold to pay back Medicaid uh, at the end of the decedent's life through the probate process. So that Medis Medicaid estate recovery program, or what we call MERP, um, is, is kind of a detriment. The, the other thing is, going back to the small business owner, um, if, if, uh, if you had a small business and you passed away, and your spouse was left with that business. If that is filed for public record, then everybody who could potentially buy that business knows that it's subject to probate, right? And so you're not going to maximize the value of the small business in a probate situation. So it would be much better to have that uh, dealt with in a private setting right where you could list it for sale maybe get a business broker somebody could the trustee could continue to run the business um, versus having it in a public process where you've listed the value of the asset on your inventory where the executor is in charge of it who may or may not be the person that you want to be in charge of your business uh, those are uh, somewhat problematic and so what we generally see is people who have uh, most small business owners their primary asset is their business right. that's what they've put all their time and effort into that they've grown the size of it it's the primary asset of their estate and most of the time what we see is that when those go through probate they are sold at fire sale prices not at market value prices and um, and that's just because of the inherent public inherit public nature of uh, the probate process so and then the other one that uh, that I see uh, problems with all the time is clients children will come in and they'll say gosh mom or dad passed away and here's their will and now I need to probate it but, you know, mom never told me where her bank account was. I had no idea. I, I don't really know where she kept her investments. I think, I think she used some guy named Jay, you know. <laughs> and uh, that's great. You know, how many guys named Jay are in the phone book, right. you know. I mean, we're, and so what the executor ends up doing or what the beneficiaries end up doing is they end up doing this private investigative work is what I call it to kind of sleuth out what the assets are that uh, their parents or loved ones left behind. Because um, remember, when you do a trust, we talked a lot about funding the trust. The, the beautiful thing about funding a trust is it's done by the person while they're living. The funding is done while they're living when they know what their stuff is and it gets retitled into the name of the trust. After they've passed away, if you're doing it through the probate process, the kids kind of have to figure it out and they have to kind of find out what did mom and dad own and what do I, who do I need to call and what do I need to do. And it, it just, it, it amazes me, but people are, play their cards so close um, that what ends up happening is they don't, they don't tell their loved ones anything. And so I, I'm not kidding. I, I mean, I wish I had a dollar for every person that walked into my office who told me, I don't know where mom and dad banked. Which is a lesson for the for the CFPs or the CFP wannabes out there, which is 
you you make sure that number one those clients do have a list of everything they own because obviously if you're doing a, a plan for them you should have that list and then the other thing is is make sure that you know those beneficiaries at, at least to the point to where they know who to call if something happens to their folks well, one so. one of the funny things about law practice is we're almost always the last one in the pool <laughs> You know, so when it comes to planning an estate, they already have their financial planner, they already have their insurance agent, they already have their stockbroker, and it's the attorney that's getting hired last. When they die, right. our names are on the wills. Right, right. We get called first. first. So that's why it's really important as a financial planner to coordinate your efforts with the attorney because when the attorney gets called because their name is on the will, if they have a relationship with you and your stuff is in their file, right. then you can they can call you and say, okay, can you pull out the last annual plan review? Do you know all the account numbers? Where did they bank? And so you're going to be that point of information. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's also a great opportunity because a lot of times you're going to be having, you're, you're going to have um, access to their investment accounts and retirement accounts, those things are going to get transferred to their kids. Most kids are happy to stay with the same financial planner. Oh, yeah. And so you have the opportunity to kind of multi-generationally plan, um, which, is a, which is a good business environment, but you can be a real asset to the family. And, uh, yeah, and both those points are huge. <laughs> if you want to stay in business, you, you learn who the beneficiaries are and, and at least work with them as much as they will let you. Um, okay, probate assets and non-probate assets. Yeah, so like we talked about before, there's some things that pass through the probate process and there's some things that pass by contract. Um, and so what it's, it's usually better to start with what are the things that are non-probate assets. So typically they're the things that pass either through joint ownership or they're going to pass through, particularly with survivorship mm, provisions, right. uh, or things that pass by beneficiary designation. So we're usually talking about life insurance, mm -hmm. we're talking about annuities, we're talking about retirement plans, we're talking about uh, payable on death or transfer on mm -hmm. death accounts. We're talking about joint tenant with right or survivorship accounts. Um, we're talking about you know somebody holding property and trust. Those are all all things where it's going to pass according to those things, as long as those things are current. Because we talked about yes. beneficiary designations yes. not being current. The what constitutes probate assets? That's really the default bucket. So right. if it doesn't pass by contract, it doesn't pass by beneficiary designation, then it's going to pass into a non-probate asset. But there's other things that are typically probate assets. Uh, real estate is, is typically, because most real estate is not owned with any kind of survivorship provision. Mm -hmm. So typically, uh, real estate passes through the probate process. Um, household and personal items. So all the furniture in your house, all the clothes in your closet, those are things that pass through the probate. Anything that has a certificate of title, if you got a boat, if you got an RV, if you got a car, those things all pass through the probate process. And again, anything that doesn't have a beneficiary designation or a survivorship uh, provision. So the way to keep things out of the probate process is either pass them by trust, which is essentially a contract, or pass them by survivorship or beneficiary designation. All right. That's what you want to do if you avoid probate. All right. So. What are the steps in probate? So when somebody walks into my office and they say, you know, mom passed away, here's your will, what do we have to do? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to file a probate application with the court and we're going to attach the will with it. And so we're going to file that at the courthouse. At, at some point in time, there's going to be a citation issue and then there's going to be a public notice that's posted. Um, typically. There's going to be a hearing that's held um, and at that hearing the judge is going to validate the will and appoint the executor just like we talked about before. Um, there's usually in most states there's some kind of notification that takes place to the beneficiary. Sometimes that's prior to the hearing, sometimes that's after the hearing, but somehow the beneficiaries are going to be notified. 
there's also a notification process to the creditors. So um, usually there's a, a notice to creditors that's published in the legal notices in the paper, and so we'll see that notice to creditors. Most people have seen that in the classified section. Usually secured creditors, like maybe your mortgage company, they're usually entitled to a direct notice where you send them a letter, here's a copy of the will, here's the probate application. If you want to file something in the probate court, you can. Um, so after you've notified creditors, notified beneficiaries, and had the hearing, then what you're going to do is the executor is going to file an inventory. So they're going to gather up the assets, inventory the assets, and they're going to submit that to the court. Um, typically, that may include appraisals at the same time. So if appraisals are required in that particular jurisdiction, you're going to submit those appraisal reports to the court as well. The court's then going to sign off on that inventory as being complete. Um, this may be the point in time where uh, others make claims against the estate or mm. contest claims. You're going to resolve those, those contested claims, um, whether it's from an heir or whether it's from a creditor. Then you're typically going to pay whatever debts and taxes are owed, and you're going to file final tax returns for the individual. Um, IRS always gets paid. Uh, next, what you're going to do is you're going to distribute the specific bequest. So, in the earlier example, you know, I gave Jay my car. So, at that point, the executor is going to give Jay the a signed certificate of title and the keys to the car and tell him to come pick it up, right? Or deliver it to his door. So, those types of specific bequests are going to be taken care of. Then, whatever's left, the residue is going to be distributed to whoever the residuary beneficiary is, the remainder beneficiary. And so whatever's left, they get a check or they get the stuff or they get the deed to the house or whatever it is. And uh, then typically the last thing is you're going to fund any trust. So a lot of times the residuary beneficiary, especially if it's minor kids, they're going to be there's going to be a trust in place for them. So you're going to get a tax ID number for the trust. You're going to open a trust account. You're going to go ahead and stick whatever funds go to that um, beneficiary into that trust. And so that's pretty much the process that you're going to go through. And uh, so you can see, especially with several of those things, creditor claims filing tax returns, especially if there's estate tax returns that are due, right. that's going to extend that time period for how long it's going to take to, to get through the probate process.